this to me is like the really fascinating material. We don't know what the answer is, but we're looking for patterns. I think we're looking at kind of a type of cosmic alchemy. The story slowly moves Still, a lot of people don't know that this technology actually exists. The possibilities here are pretty mind blowing. We can't just believe that it was the work of these lone troubled individuals. And like a conspiracy theorist would look at that and say, well, they, the, the Illuminati. Welcome back, guys, to Conspira Normal. Yeah, yeah. We are emanatizing the Eschaton in a new studio tonight. This is our backup studio because, as I said in the last episode, Rob is kind of down for the count for the next few days. He's had crazy stuff happening where he's had to be pretty much the man in charge of SIR where he works because everybody's on festival season. And he wasn't able to be there because he had to work the night of recording this on June 19th. So we are here. Uh, Serfiel got a new kind of like setup for us in his in his basement. His mom's going to bring some Hot Pockets for us in a little bit. <laughs> so, but we do have some guests on the line. And I am really happy to bring these couple people on um, from... ESP, Drawing Out the Spirits, a new podcast slash YouTube show that these guys are doing. And I want to welcome to the show Melissa Martell. Hello. And John Chadwick. Hello. You all right? Yeah. It's good to talk to you guys. Um, Melissa, I've talked to you uh, a few times. I mean, we've kind of been on roundtables together on uh, Where Did the Road Go? That's right. Yeah. So you know, that's it's always it's always good to speak to you. Um, so you have an interesting perspective on things, but let's talk a little bit about th- who you guys are, um, kind of like your backgrounds, and whoever wants to take that, whoever wants to go first. Well, um, I just um, just to start off with, we actually are going to be dropping the ESP, and we're going to just be drawing out the Spirits podcast because um, what it is is John is an illustrator, so we have guests on, and we interview the guests, and while we're interviewing the guests about various you know topics of high strangeness, John is illustrating the whole entire. He gets all the ideas in his head, and he just goes off and creates wonderful works of art. So it's a podcast, but it's on YouTube because we do it video, so everybody can see John do his magic stuff. As long as it works. <laughs> cool. As long as the cameras are working. 
Yeah, I've I've only listened to the podcast. I've listened to probably like I think like six or seven episodes, and I've only listened to the podcast version. So you guys are talking about what what a nice picture John has drawn, and I'm like, I don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> because I, yep. I I was really listening to a lot of it on my way back from California, so I had a lot of time in the car, so I wasn't able to watch it, but. Mm -hmm. Well, it started out as just a YouTube channel and we were going to live stream on Twitch and we were had so many people asking us if we would put it for just podcast because they most people listen to that stuff while they drive in their car. And that's really hard to do with a YouTube video and watch it at the same time. So we decided I decided to put it up as um, audio only. But I mean, it's. The cool, the whole kind of idea around it that makes it more unique is that visual, there's a lot of visual content there. So if that's, I try to, I try to intercede, like I try to, you know, interject it in there that, hey, for people who are listening on the podcast, you should go watch this. <laughs> yeah, it means as well, we can kind of like visually illustrate things as well, whilst, um, I mean, it's not all of the shows have got me drawing on them. So, um there could be a guest in talking on a subject and for whatever reason, like um, we can show a, an image of something that they're talking about. Oh, so, yeah. Uh, which obviously you can't get on a podcast. So, and you've got like visual cues and things. Or yeah. we could actually even go to visit a website, which we've yeah. done before. Um, so really both you guys are really like graphic artists, really. Yeah. Um, John's more the illustrator and animator, whereas I focus more websites, graphic, typography, and layout designs. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm from a filmmaking background originally, animation. Oh, really? That okay. Was my, yeah, that was my thing. So wow. that was what I, I studied. So, um, um, yeah, just basically when the British animation industry was um, looking like it was about to explode and, um, you know, and then basically didn't <laughs> in the 1990s. Oh, no. <laughs> so I had this really qualification in something that I was like uh, practically unemployable in. Um, so what but, role uh, and influence does uh, do these phenomenon have on on your artwork? Well, every, all of my uh, all, all of my films were esoterically minded because I am esoterically minded. I was like I was a weird kid. Um, um, I come from a family of um, people that are, I think, psychically aware would be one way of putting it. My grandmother was a was a healer. She was like a natural uh, medium. Her um, family had been involved in that whole spiritualist movement at the turn of the 20th century and the um, and the previous century in London, um, which I think was like a major part of like um, a lot of the esoteric stuff that was happening at the time. Uh, in fact, I found out that a lot of my other side of my family were theosophists. Oh, um, wow, okay. So basically, I am on both sides. I have necromancy on one side <laughs> <laughs> and Blavatsky on the other. <laughs> so you didn't really That's have an a choice. That's interesting mix. <laughs> Yeah, Do I mean, you... Pavatsky didn't like spiritualism either, so uh, quite, how are they, these two sides of the family going together? <laughs> do, do you buy into any of those philosophies, John? Um, that's a very tough question. That's a very tough question. I, I mean, I, I don't... A lot, I think a lot of the thing with theosophy is um, the whole Atlantean thing and the... Uh, the antediluvian masters living in the center of the earth and what have you, I find all of that absolute, like, I mean, it's like something out of a science fiction um, novel written at the time. It probably was. Um, as far as spiritualism is concerned, I mean, I've had training in that and, um, and I just came out of it with more questions than I had going in. They, in fact, actually, when I was having the training, I actually felt quite a lot of the time that they just wanted me to shut up and stop asking questions. <laughs> you know, um, I'm a bad student, basically. I, <laughs> I, I ask all the wrong things, um, <laughs> pointing out, well, actually, that could be this as well. Shut up, you're here for training. Stop you asking know. too many questions. <laughs> yeah, you're too skeptical. The spirits won't talk to you. Well, is that cheesecloth? Isn't it? Why is that? <laughs> um, so, uh, <laughs> so yeah, I was I'm a, I'm a skeptical I'm a, I was a skeptical medium. Um, I mean, I actually met on one occasion through a friend of mine. I met um, Kieran O'Keefe, um, you know, the psychologist that was on Most Haunted. 
Um, and he jokingly told me, basically, that I, I had to stop doing his job for him and decide which side I was on. Um, I couldn't be a skeptic and a medium at the same time. <laughs> Is Most Haunted still a thing over there? Is that still on? I have on? no idea. I think they show it, it is. They show, it, uh, they show it at different times of the day, and you can be quite surprised. It can be on in the morning, and um, and uh, they, they haven't gone through and edited any of it, so they're kind of like they're swearing and using all this language. It's like, <laughs> it's only half past 11. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> we we got it over here i think like the travel channel or something is where we got it and i just remember seeing like maybe one or two episodes of it and just thinking that like this is just it it, it just kind of seemed like it was kind of garbage tv to me and like there's a yeah, lot of o over overreacting and overacting and Derek akora would really you know he'd really ham it up Oh, oh yeah. yeah. I've got stories about Derek, but um, I would probably get sued by Derek. <laughs> so I'm actually probably not <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, that might be Derek. for the best. But, but, Derek's a um, lovely I, I, man. I've been, in, I've been involved with several people from that program from, um, for charity evenings and stuff. Uh -huh. And um, I, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll save it for the patrons. <laughs> I have to be very careful. Good idea. I've stood next to, the, stood next to one particular uh, medium from that program uh, whilst he was kicking the wall and saying, oh, the tapping and stuff. And, but did anyone hear where the noise came from? Yeah, from you. What are you on about? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> well, well, Melissa, you yeah, used to be involved everyone, with another podcast, right? The, uh, the, the Folklore Podcast. Oh, um, yeah, I was behind the scenes on the Folklore podcast. I helped create it, um, but I left that. I also wrote for the Curious Fortean <clears throat> um, blog online, um, and out of that, that's how I met John, through yeah. the Folklore podcast okay. and Folklore Revival, because I was on their site. Um, <clears throat> but that's, I mean, my background is a little, I don't know, It's it's, I've never been a medium i've always been fairly logical person but i i did live in a, a haunted house when i was younger um on the east coast of canada and my family does have a lot of actually similar to john where they would have had um i had an aunt that was in like um a medium and a spiritualist and a card reader in, when spiritualism was big um turn of century 1920s and all that um, my mother is you know she reads cards um and I've always been interested in it on um, a more skeptical, and I wouldn't say skeptical, I, I'm open-minded, but I'm a little more logical, I would say. And, and it was because living in, I would say, that house, and there was a lot of folklore in the town. It was an old city, and it just influenced me heavily. And, um, and I have a family who's very into folklore and genealogy and keeping track of um, family histories and stuff like that. So it's just always been a part of my life. And I sort of got back into it with working with the Curious Fortean and the Folklore Podcast. And then John was like, yeah, we should we should start something where we can do creative stuff, too. So it was yeah. um, not not quite as um, fantastic as meeting Derek Accor or anything like that. <laughs> <What's> the... <laughs> well, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Was there anything that specifically happened in that house? And where was it? What uh, what province was oh, okay. it? So um, I was born in New Brunswick, which okay. is on the east coast of Canada. And oh, I man, you're in... almost American. Like, you're so close. Almost. <laughs> oh, everything is so close to America. In <laughs> we all live along the border. We don't want to be up north. Nobody wants to be up there. <laughs> Anyways, um, I lived in a city called St. John. And um, we lived in an old Victorian house that was in the downtown area. And I, I won't give any addresses or anything like that. Um, I think the current owners don't have any issues with it, as far as I know, but um, we moved in there. Um, I lived in there with my mother, who was a single mother at the time, and she moved in with another lady who had recently divorced, and she had three children, two girls and a boy. And it was a large house, so we did have other people room with us on and off um, during the, like, the five months or so that we were there. And... You know, as, as soon as we we moved in, it just it started slowly, and then it w it escalated towards the end, where it was a more um, just common and daily. But it it started with little things like um, 
light switches going on and off and they were like the old fashion light switches where there were push buttons so they're not easy to turn on and off you have to really push them in and and um because they're like 1920s 1930s or something like that so they're not mm, easy yeah. to um manipulate or accidentally hit and so we would have problems with lights which is going on and off on their own and um people started to hear like um a voice talking and they were mistaking it for someone else or they would come in and say who are you talking to and and the person be like nobody there's nobody here so there were strange you know just little things where you'd be like okay you know you just brush it off um at first like yeah you you wouldn't think too much of it but it it started to escalate into um hearing someone walking upstairs and we would hear this walking every once in a while and i had um uh, that was my only experience, actually, that I can really recall. Most of the other experiences are other people's experiences, but my one experience was when we I was six when I lived there, and we were all sitting downstairs, and um, we started to hear... We had a babysitter in, um, as you do. My mom was a single mom, so she was working, and these they were young they were like teenagers like 18 or something like that and i start to hear we all start to hear these footsteps upstairs and so i was a bit of a smart ass kid and they were like what is that who's walking upstairs and they did a head count and all the kids were sitting downstairs and they started to get worried and think someone had broken in and i just looked at them like, oh it's just the ghosts that we have <laughs> <laughs> so yeah they, the, the, the looks on their face was not they weren't too impressed with that and so i maybe in retaliation they told me to go upstairs and check to see if it was the ghost which um i wasn't you know exactly i just i sort of walked up there and poked my head around and didn't really finish the job and go up because i was like i am not going up there by myself um but um so I didn't go up. I didn't finish um, because I was, I just wasn't. I mean, what if someone had broken in? But I went back down, you know, didn't see anything. And um, yeah, it was it. But that would happen often where we would hear this. What we knew, we, we figured it was a man because of another experience. And I was on um, the podcast I was on with um, Rojan. Yeah, on his Archivist. podcast. Yeah, Project Archivist, and I told the story of um, how um, when we had one of my uncle who was babysitting us, and I don't know if I want to retell it, but he was babysitting the kids, and he started hearing the footsteps. And when he went up, the little boy who was a paraplegic was sleeping in the room, and he went in, and he could hear him cry, and he thought it was the kids. And we were all sleeping, and the little boy who was a paraplegic, he was um, paralyzed from the waist down, was in the bedroom, his bedroom crying, and my uncle went in there and said, well, what's wrong? And he had said that there was a man, you know, walking around who was standing by the closet, and my uncle sort of just shushed him, like, go back to sleep, you know, you don't know, you're just dreaming. And then he left, and when he was going to walk down the stairs, he started to hear the footsteps again and realized they were coming from right around that area. And, you know, all the hair stood up on his neck and he didn't really want to go back up, but he did. And, you know, got the little boy out and went downstairs. Um, and this is his story. Um, so I didn't have this experience. He woke the rest of us up and made us come downstairs as well. And so that's why we knew we pretty much figured there was a man upstairs because we would hear footsteps all the time. Mm. And that little boy had said, you know, there was a man in his room. So and. Really, I, I don't know if we moved out of that house because it was haunted or if it just got to the point that the oil bill was really excruciatingly high. But it might have been a combination of the two. But we only we lived there for a short time, like five months. And it was I mean, there was there's a whole bunch of other things that happened daily. It was you know hard to remember, like just um, but the footsteps were one that happened frequently and often. Wow. Yeah, that's quite a lot of activity actually in five months really yeah, it was, yeah, it was yeah. still yeah. i often i often wondered that it had something to do with the group of people that were there because um the people who live there i don't know if they still live there now but we were visiting my grandfather a decade or so ago and my mom was walking in that area and they were standing there and she walked up and asked them and they said no they hadn't had any issues in the house so i don't know if it was just heightened because of the individuals that were involved um i have no idea but we regularly heard footsteps it was quite often 
And then, um, yeah, it was it was strange because the people who are there now don't seem to have any issues. So, and like other like I said, other people's experience, I can't collaborate with that. I can only say I heard footsteps upstairs. That was my my personal experience. But you never saw anything like I've actually never seen a ghost like visually i've only it's only been hearing or feeling something yeah i've never actually visually seen like an apparition what's been your experience with some of this stuff john um the first thing that i ever remember seeing um was um I saw what a figure at the top of uh, the stairs in the house uh, that I was in when I was a kid, um, um, and he was just dressed like my grandfather, but I, there was no head, there was no face, mm-hmm. and that was very, very odd. So there was, there was no me. head, but like, yeah, but like he was headless. Clothing. Yeah. Okay. But I recognised the clothing. It was like the he- it was like the head hadn't. Um, come through <laughs> I, can't, I can't explain it any other way he wasn't headless like a headless horseman it was like that part of the image just wasn't wasn't visual um that was the first thing i used to regularly uh, we had the telephone at the bottom of the stairs and i'd be on the um, on the phone to a friend and i'd regularly see things um, on, um on that, around that stairway um, sometimes it just looked like a figure it was like an um, like an aura of a figure. If that makes sense. Almost like if you can imagine looking through a lemonade bottle, um, well, a pop bottle, you, you would call it a bottle of Sprite or something or Seven Up. If you can imagine the way that the lights refracted through that, it would that's what it would look like. But it would be yeah. a figure, kind of a haze. Um, yeah, I mean it's kind of the thing, kind of like I mean I naturally kind of like see auras around people. So for me, it's like. Um, um, I mean, I don't see the colours. I only see kind of like almost like the white light, um, and that's what it was like. It was like somebody should have been in, inside it, if that makes sense. Um, and I kept it to myself, and I didn't tell anybody at all. And um, and um, you know, even though I'd been raised in a house where people did discuss these things, but it was like it was still a bit hush hush. And my grandmother was a bit like uh, mad for talking about these things, and. So, um, yeah, it it turned out my mum went to see a a medium with a group of friends. And um, this guy, basically, all he did was talk about me. And he knew things about me that were weird. It's like when I couldn't sleep at night, I would look out of the window next to my, directly next to my bed and look at the moon um, and just gaze at it and think, what, you know, what's going on? What is that? You know, and trying to see where people could see faces and things like that. Um, and and he told me, he, well, he told my mother that basically when I did that, my great grandmother was between myself and the bed, and nobody knew that I did that. And I was like, what the hell? Um, but he told her to go and speak to my English teacher, uh, who it turned out was a friend of his, and was also um, in um, in to do with uh, spiritualism and mediumship. And so I suppose he became a first mentor, really. Um, um, he asked me my experiences, and then he gave me a copy of Ursula Le Guin's The Wizard of Earth scene and said, read that. And um, and it, 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 it was true. That book was absolutely amazing. Um, it, it kind of, like, it taught me a lot. I think people overlook it. I don't know if you've got any of you lot have actually read this no, book. I've never like, heard of it. You said it's Wizard of Earth? The, the, Wizard, the Wizard of Earth Sea. Er, Wizard of Earth Sea? Yeah. Is it a fiction um, a, book? Is it? Yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's like a, a fantasy. Uh, um, it's about a magician. It's about a young lad who's, who's a magician, and um, and then he messes around with things he shouldn't mess around with, and releases his shadow self, wow. and then has to put his shadow self back. And you know, there's all kinds of reasons now that I'm kind of like um, uh, more clued up about like uh, um, things to do with initiation and um, like and, um, and magic and things. Um, <laughs> facing your shadow self and all manner of things like that i can actually say yeah, i know exactly why he gave me that book um and um but it didn't stop me from messing around with stuff <laughs> 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 I, mean, I, can, I, I i remember one occasion i you know like um, it must be about 15 years old and with myself and like um, four of me uh, my friends uh, um 
did uh, what we thought was a satanic ritual in a house that hadn't been uh, uh, moved into. Were you listening um, to Judas through... Priest at the time? <laughs> no, it was, no, it was all Slayer. It was all okay, Slayer. yeah. The well, good stuff. enough. Yeah, <laughs> and it still is all Slayer. I'm going to see them in November, so it, it's Ooh. still Slayer. <laughs> still Slayer. <laughs> but um, yeah, um, and uh, the police turned up and chased us, and we were in danger of kind of like uh, being the town's the town Satanists. <laughs> uh. <laughs> we had no idea what we were doing, you know. I mean, it was all everything was out of like a, a, a yeah. A that would have been a, a bad time period to uh, to be the town Satanist there. It was about, um, it must have been about 1989-ish, I think. Yeah, it's pretty Round much. about then. Satanic yeah. panic, full swing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Brave Absolutely. guy, you. <laughs> you would have been on, like, the British equivalent of Geraldo, probably, or something. <laughs> <laughs> if, anyone, if anyone turned up dead in the town, and you guys just would have been, the, like, the West Memphis Three. Well, yeah, I tell you what, my, my mum had... Um, um, uh, she knew a couple of the town doctors lived down the road from us, and they were uh, uh, charismatic Christians, um, which was about kind of like a really rare thing in our kind of like community because you you know you had Catholic churches, the Salvation Army, Church of England, and that was about it. So um, the happy clappies were kind of like still like the same as the lunatic <laughs> fringe. <laughs> yeah, that's what they call them, the happy clappies. Never heard happy that. Clappy. Have you not? <laughs> no. But, um, it's because they're really happy and they clap all the time. <laughs> 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 yeah, there's, there's a lot of them around here, man. Oh, the happy um, so yeah, she had to this prayer group praying for me. Um, and, um, and I actually ended up going through this... Um, I, I went through a really big Christian phase where I completely turned around and like uh, all of their answers were, all of their, you know, prayers were answered, but they didn't like what they got because they didn't get kind of like um, some nice young man who dressed up in smart clothing and went to the local church. They ended up with somebody who became quite like, you wouldn't know bloody Jesus if he turned up and knocked on the door, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I've seen the light. Um, <laughs> And, uh, yeah, but that that didn't last um, because the, the experiences kept happening. All the supernatural experiences continue to happen, and um, and as much as there are wonderful things to do, I think with that philosophy, they don't answer a lot of those things. If you're going through them, it, there's like one answer, and that is demons. And, yeah, um, sure. If it's not of um, if it's not of God or if it's not of Jesus. I mean, it's even like you've got to pray. Are you of God or are you of Jesus? And uh, and the people would say this, and it's still there. <laughs> I can still see it. <laughs> you know, banish it. You know, it's still there. <laughs> you know. Um, oh, so that was my that experience. Show. All manner of things. I mean, I was involved in exorcism and things like this. Um, um, oh, you know, you can't let that pass. You got to tell us a little yeah. bit about this. Out with the well, demons, John. <laughs> well, it was basically after this kind of like conversion. I think basically because I was. Did you like, play in some Slayer and they left? <laughs> and, no, but I was deemed to be this kind of almost like this cool like um, person who could talk to the kids and um, and you know and it was like just let him swear. Oh, you're the youth <laughs> pastor. Bad, just let him swear. <laughs> and um, and I found that really awkward because I, I still had an element of embarrassment because, like, um, you know, I was still kind of like this kind of like skater kid and what have you. And um, it wasn't a very cool thing in, like, uh, you know, what, about 1990, 1991 to be this, uh, to be this Christian um, at all. But, um, yeah, there's been a few times where basically, I mean, I've had to kind of like... Um, um, deal with things and kind of like um, and and try and get rid of them from places. Um, so I don't know. I mean, what do you want to hear? Do you want to hear something about something coming out of someone, or do you want to hear about something like in um, um, in a building, or or do you want to hear all of those? Well, How let's let's hear about something coming out of someone. Yeah. yeah. Now, was okay. this something that you were doing when you were going through this Christian phase, or was this yeah. something later? Yeah. No, it was it was when I okay. was well and truly in it, mate. <laughs> I was, uh, yeah, I had mm. faith. <laughs> and I, I couldn't. The, the truth of the matter is, is that I still know for a fact that I couldn't have done any of those things if I didn't have that faith. And I think that um, having a faith in something, whatever it is, is still really important when you're dealing with those things. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
you know, there's all this kind of thing of like, oh, put a crucifix there. I think if you, I mean, coming from a discouraging point of view, which I kind of consider myself to be now, uh, you could hold a carrot up, and if you believed in it strongly enough, it would work as well. Hail Eris. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, absolutely, Hail Eris. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, if all else fails, um, um, hit the demon with a copy of Cosmic Trigger. That's what I say. <laughs> there's one right behind me. Yes. <laughs> That's a, it's a, there's an old, it's a old printing, too. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, there was this lad I knew. I was at art college, and um, he... He could predict cards like um, oh, it was just amazing. Like uh, he he could tell you the next card that was coming in a pack, yeah, and um, and I finally found out from him that um, he had a voice that said no, <laughs> right? Um, and um, it was he yeah, he had a little a little man living in his neck. Uh, and I was going, right, well, I understand all of this. These are kind of like entry points, etc. Um, the back of your neck is supposed to be a place where kind of like demons reside. Um, and um, and it just said no to him. So we, he would basically go through an entire deck of cards until it stopped saying no. That was his trick. Um, that was how he did it. Um, and at the point it didn't say no, he would say, yeah, seven of hearts. And boom, there it would be. Um, you and, should have um, took him to Vegas, man. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Well, maybe, yeah. Um, he was a re really odd guy, um, obviously, apart from the fact that he had a little man living in his neck. I mean, that, <laughs> yeah, that wasn't the strangest thing about him. That, that was the norm. Yeah, that was the normal thing. Uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah, he was the first person I knew that talked about seeing kind of like uh, little balls, balls of light. He was the first person ever. And he would say to me, I can see it, and it's there. Can't you see it? And I wouldn't be able to see it because I wasn't attuned enough yet. So he, he was, um, he, he was like, as far as a visionary, visionary person he was concerned, he was well ahead of, our, of myself. But in my Christian arrogance, you need to come and meet these people, and, I, you know, we need to kind of like help you and get this out of you, et cetera. And, um, yeah, I was sat next to him when um, it actually well he, uh, I, I, I tricked it i had to trick it out of him um that's part of the thing that i found a lot with this kind of like this dialogue you have to get its name once you've got its name you can bind it and once you can bound it you can banish it in whatever form it is but you've got to know what you're dealing with to be able to kind of like sort this situation out and um you know, it was all this kind of like, oh, in the name of Jesus, um, name yourself, blah, 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 blah. And it just kept coming, no, 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 no. And after a while, it just suddenly struck me, well, that's its name. And as soon as it, that was the thing that was brought up, like its name is no, it was kind of very strange. I kind of, uh, I actually saw this thing coming out the back of his neck, but it looked like nothing you would ever um, imagine. It looked like like an amoeba huh. um it, it was almost like a transparent like um, um like a sea cell? creature like a nymph like a cell oh that's yeah. so and bizarre it had like, a, like quite a long tail that came out it curled out um, it's like a parasite it, or something we, yeah, weird it, yeah, it was yeah. weird it kind of like looked almost like a tadpole kind of a shape oh. um um, but you could, I could actually kind of like see that it had almost like little colours inside. It was almost like it had organs. I can't explain it any other way than that. It was ethereal. And it came out and it curled around the side of his face and it went upwards and off. Um, and I thought, that's really, really interesting. Because obviously we always equate upwards with heaven, don't we? And downwards with, with hell. Why? Is it, we've done this. We've banished it. It's gone upwards. Um but it just took me as being a very stupid and, you know, as far as demons are concerned, you know, it was probably the most simple and almost idiotic thing. You, you know? almost felt like it was could... innocuous in a way, right? Yeah. Like it was kind of yeah. just something that was there and everyone else's perceptions of it was thinking that it was possibly something that was evil. Yeah. And, 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 and Melissa it, uh, brings up a good point when she says parasites, because that is one yeah. theory about yeah. these entities yeah. is that they can be parasitical almost like yeah, some kind of that. spiritual life form that that will yeah. live off our energy basically well, me john I, I, and i, I talked about fear. that 
Yeah. Yeah. We um, talked about that on our show about John's experience on um he at the red line in Avery Circle and our you know at the end we were talking about how they were triggering fear to feed off energy. Mm -hmm. Like and whatever it, it was. It's interesting if you look at the monsters incorporated film it's like that's actually exactly what it is that they're doing right like they're going and getting right. power from right. kind of like because scary it's fear is like point. yeah i always thought that is weird um, because, because fear is so extreme and it's so intense for such a short period of time yeah. I and mean, you can't get anything off of somebody who's just happy and consistent right i mean it's it's <laughs> electromagnetic you can feel it you, yeah. you get chills that's you know? absolutely right Absolutely right. That's static electricity. I mean, that's one of the things that always interests me. Is that why are they, is it always equated with static electricity? It's almost like they've already found somewhere where they can reside. Um, but um, yeah, the one I saw in um, in um, in Avebury, the red the red lion. Um, I mean, the room I was in is famously haunted by a man and a woman. Um, I had, um, I mean, go and listen to the episode um, that, that, that I did. I mean, there's all the information there of everything that happened to me really there. Um, mm -hmm. But, I mean, there were poltergeist activity, all kinds of things happening in the room. The sound of wallpaper being ripped off the wall um, was a weird one, which I didn't even know was um, connected with poltergeist uh, um, cases. Um but at the end of it, I ended up kind of like making a deal with it and just saying, look, I'm, I'm out of here in the morning. You know, can I just get a bit of sleep? Uh, <laughs> you know, out of despair. Yeah. I, mean, I, 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 They must have thought that I wet the bed because of the amount of cold sweat fear that I was in, really. And um, But yeah. I saw this thing at the bottom of the bed um, and it looked like a, a druid or a monk. And I looked at it and, I, and it suddenly struck me that's ridiculous sorry that's like you know i'm in avebury i'm in the middle of a stone circle that's too obvious and as soon as i questioned huh. that it changed into a woman in like um mm -hmm. a, like a, something you would see somebody wearing in a a bbc historical drama something like pride and prejudice or something and I, and that just struck me like it fits with so many of these ideas of the trickster that are really popular and in now um, that you know these things aren't these things are kind of like you're projecting there's somehow or other there's a communication where you're projecting something with it you're that's the communication what it appears as is it somehow draws this image out of you and there it, it will be that thing and, and then it was just amazing that i actually questioned it and it changed and it just makes me wonder how many people do maybe that's a thing we should all now do whenever you see anything question it and point out to it, you know. Sorry, that's that's ridiculous. That's corny. That's that, too that cliched. Seems like, that seems like real in <laughs> intelligence and not just some kind of mm. like time mirror or you know something like some kind of residue right. playing out. Right. You yeah. Know, it seems like actual intelligence. Well, there were a lot of those balls of light in that room um, that were always going over that, that bed as well. Um, and there was a, a small red one, a small dark blue one, and uh, one that was about the same size as a softball um, that was like a light blue. And um, they were active um, all the time that I was in the room from the start. I and mean, even when I stepped in there in the morning, they were active. Um, so um, once again, I mean, it's kind of like it's that whole thing um, that people are now talking about, you know, um, even with Skinwalker Ranch, it's balls of light, it's the trickster, it's um, something appearing to be something, but is it that thing, you know? Um, I mean, does that make any sense? Does that, I don't know, resonate with anybody? I've heard a, a lot of talk like that on Soraya's show. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't think we know what we're dealing with at all, and, um, and I don't think we're meant to either. Yeah, that's true. That is, that is that is very very true. I don't know if any of you guys have ever read um, Nick Redford's Final Events, but he talks about yeah. certain things in that as well. Uh, yeah. About how some of these entities will appear and uh, they can kind of live off fear and and all this and and also too, you know, like the Greg Bishop's uh, co-creation theory is another. Is, is very similar to what you just yeah. described where the entity will basically co-create whatever image it wants to show you yeah. you are when then you are part of you are also a part of that process yeah there's a great book called light quest um by i shall remember his name i'm terrible with names today 
Oh, um, British UFO author. Um, sorry, the name's absolutely gone. Um, Andrew Collins. Um, and he claims that he thinks that what is actually happening is that they're creating some kind of like bubble bubble around us. Um, and um, you are it's almost like you're in a separate place, which he equates to um, um, uh, what was the place that Jacques Foley used to talk about, the road to Magonia. That's what he considers it to be. It's almost like that is the fairyland. You know, you're within something with this thing. And maybe it's trying mm. to communicate, and that's the only way it can communicate. And we're misinterpreting it because we haven't got the capacity well, to communicate you know, with it. I mean, a lot of this stuff with fear, it kind of reminds me of um, experiences people have with sleep paralysis. And I've had experiences with like yeah. shadow people peering over my bed, and they always showed up when there was times of like either extreme stress or you were already in a bit of a fear and anxiety. And um, I've had them stand in my doorway. And one time I finally just was like, no, you're not welcome here. Get out. You're not invited. And it just disappeared. And I wasn't paralyzed. So I knew I wasn't sleep par par you know, paralysis. I was fully able to move. But it, there it was standing there. And it seems like, oh, it's almost like it knew. It's like, okay, she's having some anxiety or she's having some stress. It's time to show up. And I was like, no, no, you're not showing up here. <laughs> um, I was, I, so it reminds me of a lot of people having a lot of these um, experiences. And say, the same with sleep paralysis is a lot of them have gone through traumas. Yeah. I'll tell you what was uh, interesting with that red lion thing. I, mean, I think we discussed this as well, was that... Um, I was actually so scared that I actually ended up going back to kind of like um, old traditions within me of, of saying the Lord's Prayer in an attempt to kind of like um, protect myself and ask for help. And um, you could only get, I could only get so far through it and then I'd forget the next lines. And that's quite a common thing I've heard from other people that when uh, they actually stumble on the Lord's Prayer it's supposed to be a big sign of basically all oh, Satan is here, that he's kind of like preventing you from actually being able to kind of like finish these wonderful words, um, which are actually Egyptian, so that doesn't make any sense <laughs> at all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the Lord's Prayer is basically from uh, the Osiris uh, um, times. Um, so, yeah, quite why the Lord's Prayer would work against Satan, I don't know. But there you it's go. It's probably all about belief, like you said. Yeah. Right. Right, exactly. Yeah, it's 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 extremely interesting stuff. All these kind of all these kind of experiences that people have. Um, I know. I can totally understand why people think that people who have them are mad because they don't make sense, and you know, there's no there's, there isn't any logic to them. Um, all that makes me think about. I'm a bit of a, a casual Buddhist myself, and. You know, being a Westerner, when you're studying a lot of this stuff, you know, it's explained a lot of times, uh, especially in the more like mystical traditions with, oh, yeah, you know, these are these are uh, these are just analogies. They're, these aren't actual beings, et cetera, that are, you know, manifestations of a lot of this like negativity and bad karma and all this kind of stuff. But when you look at these kind of phenomenons, it's like maybe. Uh, so, some of these, this ancient teachings had to deal with actual things showing up associated with, you know, the same phenomenon we're talking about. I, I hadn't really thought about it like that before, but. Yeah. Well, I, I do wonder how much of it is Tulpa, though, which obviously is a right. Buddhist tradition as well. Um, yeah. I was going to say. Can do that. I mean, I was going to say it's either that or or you're projecting some sort of inner right, like that's right. how the anxiety is coming out. You're literally sending a projection out or you've created it over time and it just got strength. Just like, yeah, a talpa. I do think, like, you know, if you've got continuously got ghost groups going into something, uh, going into somewhere and continuously communicating and asking for communication. I mean, um, you know, I can't think of any other other more intense way of creating a tulpa than that you know um they're all going in there to speak to the same ghost who you know in all likelihood wasn't there in the first place but by the time that like 30 of them have been in over the space of like um, um three months um it certainly will be there because they've gone and created it um 
I, I, I do sometimes wonder if that's actually is what is happening to a lot of these places. I don't know what anyone else thinks, but um... that there's that there's a kind of the way that people put their influence onto an environment could also yeah. have something to do with it as well. Yeah. Um, like if you well, think about the, the Avery Stone Circle that you were talking about, I mean, think how old that thing is and how exactly. many people over the years have invested so much energy into the, the rituals and, and, and all that. I, I think it's, I'm, I'm not sure if it's pre Stonehenge or if it's after Stonehenge, but it's kind of like of a similar period. So we know we're talking about, um, what's that? It must be about 4,000 years old or something. Um, yeah. I was, I was having this conversation with someone the other day, like about let me see if i can collect this it's like i was talking about vancouver island where i live now having some similar phenomenons around it with poltergeist that that reminded me of avebury and the stone circles and things that john had said and he was like well what, what do you think it is and i said i don't know i think it might be us interacting with some kind of living force that's there and then there's also that 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 whole people from the past has interacted with that and there's this whole bunch of collective things coming forth creating some kind of phenomenon that you see i i mean because otherwise why would somebody at avebury see these globes and they burst into snakes and then somebody yeah. else like john sees them turn into uh, you know something else and people are actually seeing these globes but they're turning into different they're, they're turning into different things and it's not you know everything's not entirely consistent so it must have something to do with the individual plus the history there plus something actually that's happening in the atmosphere i mean I, I i don't know maybe there's different layers there maybe we have um you know like they talk about different dimensions and different layers like they're not different places they're actually layered right on top of us we just can't see them i you know i don't know but yeah. there's something interacting with us well i mean even the foo fighters take that same um, I mean, obviously, I'm not talking about Dave Grohl and Co. I'm talking about the, um, the <laughs> fighters that were um, playing. UFO. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, although maybe Dave Grohl is a shapeshifter. Who well, knows? Yeah, it's the whole kind of chicken and the egg thing. We talked to Joshua yeah. Kutchin a lot about that. And, uh, you know, we went back and forth kind of about the same, you know, are these places of power so people built on them or did what people did on these places create them? Uh, create the power in these places or you know it's that whole it's that whole debate well i think there might certainly when people choose to build places there's there's obviously a, a logical strategy that's going on like i mean right. we like hill forts and you know putting your towns near waterways or ports i mean there's obviously some logical things that are going on i, I don't believe that they were i believe they're probably just as intelligent as we are today so there, i think there's some strategy going on there but i i think it's the human energy and activity that creates all the other mythical like stuff following Oh, yeah, right, and the what, beliefs and the religion. and We know what happens when people build stupid cities and places where there's no resources. They just end up empty. I mean, but if you needed things like water, they would be important things. So maybe they, uh, so you would build next to a river, and so therefore it would be um, something maybe that you'd do things like throw swords into and give treasures to, uh, things like this. Um, John, I wanted to ask you about, since we... we we're touching on the subject of UFOs. Um, this you you've been mentioning this on the show, and this is a, I guess is it a diary that uh, uh, talks about fairy encounters. Right. Um, What's the history a, behind this? What there was an old Scottish. Um, I think he was a, he was a reverend um, of. Um, no, it would have been Scotland, so I think it would have been some kind of like an like um, Episcopal church or something. And this is back in the um, late 1600s. And his name was uh, the Reverend Thomas Kirk, and he um, he went missing. He went off with the fairies, and, um, and when he came back, he wrote this book called The Secret Commonwealth of... Um, of the elves and fairies and something else, I think it's called. You can find copies of it online um, as a PDF if you wanted to read it. Um, and um, 
you know, he talks about all the different um, groups of elves and fairies, etc. Um, and it's been suggested long time for a long time that there's kind of like similarities between the alien abduction um, uh, phenomenon and and fairy. I mean, by fairy, I'm not talking about anything like Tinkerbell or um, you know, right? Um, it's not a Disney-fied fairy. I mean, these are nature spirits um supposedly. and they're usually really mean yeah and they're also associated with the dead a lot um yeah. which i also find really interesting because a lot of the um imagery that they'll talk about is still balls of light again and yet we still now have this whole thing with those balls of light being um orbs and dead people so it's all part and parcel of the same thing but um, he supposedly went off with these um with these things and he had very similar kind of like encounters well um, I think it must have been about September um, last year. Um, I was through in Durham with uh, Mandy Pachoriak, who started the Folk Horror Revival group, um, which has become like just so successful. Um, I mean, it's amazing how many people I come across are kind of like members of this, um, you know, people that I don't even know. I'm, I'm meeting through things like, you know, this podcast. And, oh, is yeah, this a remember. Facebook group or is this yeah, a, a, is this a like Facebook a... group? Okay. But it's, but it, there's also a blog. Um, um, I think it's just folkhorrorrevival.com. Uh, and, um, you know, we've had events and all kinds of things. We had a big event in the British Museum. Um, we had another one up in Edinburgh. We've got one coming up in Newcastle um, next month. And, um, yeah, it's just basically it, it's coming from kind of like an angle of, those uh, great films like Witchfinder General, uh, The Wicker Man, uh, Blood on Satan's Claw. It's like folk traditions. It's going back to those kind of like folk traditions within horror. I, I um, got to see The Witchfinder General. That just. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you, not, not to digress too much, but I saw a documentary about that on Netflix and that just like blew my mind that that was even a thing. Yeah, it's oh, great. Yeah. I think, we, um, I think over here, over here in the in the states, they're going to reinstitute that pretty soon, probably. Well, <laughs> Vincent, Price, Vincent Price's greatest performance, um, yeah, because the, the director kind of like just kept saying to him, "Don't act," <laughs> and because um, yeah. he was like, he didn't want him in the role in the first place. He thought he was hammy, which of course Vincent Price is, is why we love him. But in that film, he is not. He is as no. stone cold as anything. It's because the, the director refused to let him act. And Vincent Price I'm sorry, Melissa, I stepped over you, what you were going to say. Yeah, sorry. We went through to Durham to see Mummy, a Mummer's play, um, which was happening up at the university. The university's um, uh, part of it is actually part of the cathedral, um, and there's a the part of the castle there, so it's like really medieval place. I mean, they filmed Hogwarts for Harry Potter up at, up this place. Um, and before we went to this event, we just thought we'd pop into the um, into the gallery, um, see what they had on, and they had this exhibition of fairy on, and there were there was Robert Kirk's actual journals in a cabinet, and he had illustrated them, and I had not come across this ever before. Um, it was absolute news to me. Um, and, uh, yeah, the drawings of them um, were thin people with long white hair, which is the exact description that people used to see of um, UFO um, occupants um, pre the grey days. Um, I think they were considered to be the Pelagians. Um, and his drawings were there. And it was like, it was just... Mind blowing, and I couldn't get a photograph. I, I wasn't allowed to take a photo. So, and I just think this needs researching, because that basically, it says that this is a really old phenomenon. Um, right. You know, right. it's yeah, for someone else to is, go and look into. That is really fascinating. I believe. Melissa, do you have any thoughts on that? No, I. You know, I'm not really familiar with it all. Well, I, I believe those notebooks are in, uh, were on loan from Edinburgh University. So if anybody wanted to go and kind of like try and get um, hold of um, um, permission to go and have research of these things, I think it needs to be done. But, it, you know, it's still such a fringe topic. Are academics going to let you in to kind of like research it? I don't know. Melissa, speaking of Witchfinder Generals, mm -hmm. aren't you related to a Witchfinder General? Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
No, I'm not related to a witch finder in general. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I have a couple of really interesting um, family tree relations. Um, now I'm going to have to remember um, the name. I was r- related to someone who, um, you know, Cotton Mathers. He yes. was in the Salem witch trials. Now I'm not related to him. My relative, um, the name will come to me. I was um, unprepared. He wrote a book sort of mocking Cotton Mather's book. Uh, um, and I don't even have that information up in front of me. Um, but I could probably pull it up. Um, so he wrote a book. And it was um, he was sort of against all the witch trials in Salem. So um, he wrote a book mocking Cotton Mather's book. And I cannot recall what his book was off the top of my head right now it was like wonders of the mysterious world or something like that and then um k leaf was my relative's last name i believe it was like robert or john k leaf and yes i, I yeah, pulled that up on my phone just as you yeah, said that yeah yeah k leaf and he k leaf wrote a book called more wonders of the invisible world or whatever sort of kind of mocking um cotton mather's book because he was um I'm not going to say they were using complete logic. They were probably referencing the Bible. And um, I believe Rogan said they were probably using the Maleficarium, or I I can't remember. But he was saying that, you know, you needed more evidence than hysterical people, you know, accusing people of stuff for witchcraft because... um, And I think in, in a lot of... I think, was it the Pendle Witch case in England like there was a lot of like this there's this idea that children can't lie and they don't say anything wrong or they don't tell tales and that's just Mm. not true and I think he probably knew that not to be true so we had that relation um from the United States and they one of their sons would have came up to Canada because they were loyalists to the British crown and they married into the Fry family um eventually and the Fry family that I'm related to uh, through my mother and my grandmother, they go right up uh, to the Plantagenets in England. So it's okay. like, it's like what, you know, the Plantagenets are like the, they were kings of England. And they're sort of, if you um, look at, um, oh, Game of Thrones, Game of Thrones is kind of based on the bloody, ruthless Plantagenet. Yeah, the War of the <laughs> yes, Roses. Yes, it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They it's were like pretty the Tudors came to power. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, if you're cited one, we would never have had Henry the Eighth. <laughs> no, we wouldn't have. But they were pretty aggressive <laughs> and manipulative. <laughs> yeah, so, well, Richard, Richard the Third, who was the uh, last Plantagenet king, he supposedly yeah. had his nephews murdered. Um, well, that that could have been Tudor conspiracy, though. Because, I mean, yes. you, you, yes. you look at it, the Tudors really had to make sure because they didn't have a strong claim to the throne. There were still Plantagenets that could have came in there. So they had to make sure people looked at it poorly. So they were smear campaigning like crazy. It, so It could have been Henry the Seventh. <laughs> that is still a possibility. Yeah. And so, yeah. so much of what our, you know, so much of what we get is handed to us from Shakespeare. Yeah. And he made Richard the Third, you know, the villain. Hey, a hunchback, which he, he, right, he wasn't he, true. Right. He had scoliosis. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 you know, Shakespeare was, was writing for Elizabeth, That's which, right. you know, Henry the Seventh, yeah. he, he had to make that side look heroic. Yes, exactly. Because that's the side that won. Yeah. Exactly. So I believe, if I can get this correctly, the line goes up. It's not through Richard the Third. It is through Henry the Third. Henry the Third's had two kids, and one of his his sons. That's where the line Edmund. That's where the line comes down through to the and eventually to the Fry family, and that we were related to. Um, well, so it's like forty generations removed. So it just goes to show you, you can eventually end up broke and living on an island in Canada. Oh, I, I, <laughs> my okay. So so my father did genealogical research back Mm -hmm. in the 80s and he actually found a connection to us to edward the third so we're just probably distant relatives we're related that's awesome (laughs) you guys can organize the the coup (laughs) yeah i'm I'm, I'm sure they were all related then as they are now (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> just like every president except for Abraham Lincoln and Kennedy and all the ones that got shot. Yeah, bing, bing, bing. it's amazing. That's isn't how that it? Goes. Actually, even the Bush family are kind of like some. <laughs> they're related to like uh, Winston Churchill, and Winston Churchill was yep. uh, um, related to Diana Spencer, and obviously Diana Spencer's kids are now kind of like, uh, well, one of them's going to be king, and it's like. How weird is this? Or is it? Or is it the Illuminati? Mm, yeah, they, that's where they, it's they, going. They actually, you know what's interesting the about 13 that? 13 bloodlines of the Illuminati. Is that <laughs> we're, we're, we're way digressing here. But what's interesting about that is that Diana's bloodline goes through an illegitimate son of Charles II. So there's Stuart blood oh, right. in there as well. Ah, uh, yeah. They, uh, I think they actually had have a stronger claim to the throne than the um, than the Windsors did. Obviously, yeah. like the, the name Windsor was adopted. Um, the Sax Gold. The, the, and they were also Battenbergs as well. Uh -huh. um, so they're kind of like they're basically Sax Coburg uh, Gotha. Yeah, yeah. Sax Coburg yeah. Gotha. They they wanted yeah. to change that fast after World War One. <laughs> That's right. Uh -huh. Yeah. So so John, I mean, you know, I. I, I just don't want to single you out because you're British. But what's going to oh, happen God. when the Queen dies? Is, are they going to skip Charles? Are they? What's going to happen? Um, there'll be a media frenzy, um, <laughs> and I won't pay a huge amount of attention. All right. <laughs> no, I don't know. Charlie don't know. will get it, but not for long. Was, the whole royal wedding thing was like um, was a difficult one for to, to avoid, and I ended up yeah, watching it, yeah. and ended up it was hard to avoid it here. To. Yeah. Um, but I thought the, I thought the ceremony was fantastic. I thought there was so many like um, powerful things said in that church in front of the royal family from um, that um, minister, minister, and whether or not he intended to shake them up or not. But I mean, there were things in there about kind of um, slavery and all manner of things. And I thought, yeah, good on you. This is the most punk rock royal wedding we've ever had. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> <laughs> you know, John Lydon should have been doing this. <laughs> Did you imagine? <laughs> That's a bigger point than John Lydon ever has, to be perfectly honest with you. I thought it was fantastic. Johnny Rotten officiates the, <laughs> yeah. the royal wedding. <laughs> Oh, God. Other people didn't see it, you see that, so maybe it was just me. <laughs> but I was going, go on, I want you to now quote Malcolm X. Tell him. Please, please quote Malcolm X. <laughs> Truth to power, huh? Was, well, it, yeah. was that because that she's she's half African American? I think Is that what so. it was? Okay. But, um, you know, I mean, I'm not an elitist uh, in, uh, in a long way, and I have very mixed feelings about the royal family. I'm not as diehard as I was. I used to be very, very anti. I'm not now. Mm -hmm. I think you yeah. change as you as you get older, don't you? You kind of like calm down a bit. Um, but if you look at the British establishment, it's been there for an awful long time, and you know um, a lot of the wealth that came into this small country came from slavery and um, and that's not something to be proud of in any way shape or form and i appreciate that it was happening all around the world and i appreciate that there were white people also being taken as slaves and being sold mm -hmm. in north africa and slave markets um i mean there was an entire village in ireland i'm not sure if, if you all knew this but then um, they took everybody um and they were never seen again um from by uh, um north african um, um slavers so it was happening everywhere but still, I don't think anybody did quite as well out of it as the British did, did they? I mean, um, and um, I thought it was great that that guy was there saying that. As far as Charles is concerned, I think he'll be king. Don't see why not. We've had dippier kings. Not for long. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, George III was an absolute lunatic. Um, you true. say that like you were there. I was. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. I'm, I'm Saint Germain. <laughs> oh, that's a, we just were talking about that tonight. Oh my God, that's a, such a weird synchronicity. We were just talking about Saint Germain earlier. <laughs> Earth cosmic coincidence control office has turned up. Oh tonight. yeah. Yes. I love yes. synchronicity. Yes. Well, Melissa, I gotta ask you. Um. And I'll see you post stuff on Facebook a lot. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, if everybody doesn't know, you're Canadian. I am. And Jordan Peterson. So what's up with this guy? 
What's yeah. like the? Well, I mean, are you a fan of his? Do you, I mean, like, like, I just kind of want to get because I hear a lot about him here in the mm-hmm. states, but I kind of want to get like the Canadian perspective on this. Well, I, you know, I, I, did, I came across um, Jordan Peterson on um, Joe Rogan actually, so I came across him on an American podcast uh, of everything, and I think. Um, where he's coming at is he is um, he's a more conservative, probably actually a, you would call him conservative and conservative in Canada is very different than Republican in America. It's just got a different flavor. But I think he's more like a, just a standard liberal. Like your old class liberal, where it's you know freedom of speech and the rights of the individual sort of thing, and um, I think as a professor in the University of Toronto, he was seeing a lot of um, what he would call social justice warrior sort of acts that um, that weren't about equality of opportunity because equality of opportunity is very important that everybody have all the same rights all the same acts and all the same access to things like the ability to prove you know their talent and their skill i mean he there's no debate about that everyone has um you know the uh, quality of um access like they get the same access and we're all equal under the law But I think where he came in is he was opposed in Canada to a bill um, called C-16 because in the bill it was not what it was a very vague bill and he didn't like the vagueness of it because it was basically making a law in Canada that um, Canadians, if they did not use someone's preferred pronoun, could be charged, fined, and if they didn't pay the fine, in some way there was a possibility you could go to jail. So there was a list of a whole bunch of pronouns, like 60 of them. They're not he or she. They're made-up pronouns that nobody... And and it's fine if someone asks you to call them something. That's different than making a law forcing you to call them that or you could be called a bigot it's it's an unfair law and it was so vague it wasn't specific that he realized that anyone could use that in and um there's a lot of activists who don't necessarily speak for all transgender people and they they're sort of in these universities and they're they've got a sort of more of a marxist sort of outlook and he wasn't for it because he didn't like the vagueness of the law and of course they you know everybody was calling him a bigot but exactly what he said would happen really did happen and they tried to use it against a an english ta student in the university trying to call her bigot because she showed up public um a tv she showed a tv show clip of jordan peterson in one of her classes and then she showed the other viewpoint in a very neutral way and they tried to accuse her of all sorts of things and use that law against her so and she did nothing wrong like yeah it's out of control so that's where his sort of fame started to come in and he's sort of he's very not for social justice warriors and i just agree with him that we have to have um Everyone has to have equal rights, women, men, transgender, you know, gay, like you all have to have the same laws. But the problem is, is trying to have the same outcome. Um, So if I um, am not as good at something or, okay, my podcast doesn't get as many views as your podcast and I deem that unfair, um, you know, am I supposed to insist that I have the exact same outcome? You you know, you can't. You can't make it the yes. same. <laughs> John, John, John is not. John is bad. John is bad. He's a podcast communist. Yeah. You can't. You have to let people, the free will of the people, come out and them to choose what they want. You can't make a law when in saying everybody must be the same because not everybody doesn't have even though we have the same rights and we should have the same access we don't all have the same skills there are things men are going to be able to do better than me just because of um physical strength and there was also a debate about yeah running in that but there was there's (laughs) there was also the debate on biology like they're saying there is no biological 
aspect to gender or sex and that's not that's not true there is biological things that separate us that's why women have babies and certain things happen they're saying it's all social constructed well there is some social construct to gender but there's a lot of there's biological too so there was all this debate around it and i i agreed with him that you cannot guarantee the outcome of everything because otherwise you're you're, you're you're chasing around and you're trying to alter too many things you'd have to make laws like crazy well, and, and if you want to transform culture, mm -hmm. then legislation is really not the way to do it. Yeah, I that's mean, wrong. culture is being transformed. It doesn't happen yeah. through legislation. Exactly. Yeah. So it, it and and the only thing that happens is a blowback, and really, it's it works against uh, you know whoever's trying to do that in the first place. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I mean, with language, especially with language, it has to. It's not you don't go and regulate language. It that's like yeah, it's like out of control. Insane. People you know, have to agree on it. It's 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 that is really so much like something from um, from 1984, the George Orwell book, you know, mm -hmm. which they yes. called Newspeak. Newspeak, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah. and I I find that really frightening. And I don't care whether or not that comes from the right or it comes from the left. At the point where people are kind of like being dictated to, it, it, it's scary. I mean, I'm a, a liberal person. Um, Always have been, and I think because it's just basically a fair way of living your life. Respect people, be kind to people, you know, regardless of who yeah. they are or but whatever. The, you know. But now I'm discovering that I'm actually kind of like I'm actually right wing now. Yeah. Well, that's, <laughs> that's like, because and, that's and because the left has pushed Nazi. so far left. The yeah. left has pushed so far left, and the the problem with that is 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 Western society is built upon, and it's not perfect. It's never perfect, but it it works because it's built on honoring the rights of the individual, and that's under attack because it's group identity politics. Mm -hmm. If you know, saying like like it's it's sort of under attack when you're saying you as an individual is not as important as a group, and I don't think it should be that way. Because I don't think we should always be, I, I don't want to necessarily always be identified as a woman or this or that. I, I want to be judged as an individual ultimately because that, that's how we get equal and the fairest representation is where we're, we're, we have individual rights. Otherwise, we can also get lost in a group. Like our bad behaviors can get overlooked and we can sort of float by. I, I just and think it, that, yeah. yeah, go ahead. It also seems like the left has lost its soul because uh, in in pursuing all of what people call identity politics, they've really left class behind. Yeah. And that that really was, you know, its concentration in the past. Mm. And so now you have phenomenon. You, you have such a rise in right wing populism because yeah. of that. And it's, it, you know, it's, it's well, very interesting. Just I mean, having, so that, that's crazy. scary. I mean, we've got just, a problem over here. Obviously, we always yeah, have a problem yeah. with the right over here. Yeah. I mean, in just the just having this discussion, someone could call us right wing, oh, yeah, and absolutely. I'm a yeah. I've voted liberal all my life. Right, well, I'm, st I'm trying to stay out of it a bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think that's true for I think that's true for all of us. But it's interesting to see all these kind of trends, and to see because I mean, over here in my country, Trump was the the um, what's the right word the he 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 he's the visualization of all this yeah. you know, he's the result of this kind of this kind of politics he's the result of this kind of politics over here yeah. mm. and you know john for you brexit is the same thing almost um, it, it, it kind of is it's kind of like i think canada's going to go that going to go this way now because trudeau yeah. is so far left that yes. it's almost ridiculous yeah, nobody. I I got a lecture. I'm not gonna say who, but someone flipped out on on me about because me and another Canadian were kind of. He saw it as we were bashing Trudeau, and he was not from Canada, and he thought Trudeau was you know the only a leader from the West. And I'm like, no, you know Trudeau is playing too many faces. He's you know he's out there pretending that he cares and he's all this nice you know feminist, and then he's screwing Canadians over. You know, paying 4.5 billion dollars for some pipeline and and telling us we can't use people kind. We are our mankind. We have to use people kind. Just strange, weird things that don't matter. And, uh -huh. or, you know, he's not supporting, you know, money for people who have fought in combat, but he he wants money toward in making these really weird laws. It's, it's like he doesn't really have a really good idea of what's important. 
Do you okay. know what it all reminds me of? Yeah. Um, and somebody else pointed this out to me. They 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 feel as like, like when they were a kid and they used to read um, Judge Dredd comics. <laughs> this this was like a comedy. It was satire. <laughs> and now we're actually in. It's like we are living in Mega City Four now. It's oh like some of the stuff that they were satirizing is now actually happening. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, even as far as kind of like reality TV. I mean, you know, it's the point where like you've got. Well, over here we've got John Lennon Airport, and that's like, wow, that was in 2000 AD, where there would be like a Ronald Reagan block or something <laughs> um, that was at war with, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, Margaret Thatcher block. Um, and, and there's a lot of those kind of politics um, which they were satirising. It, it, it's now it's happening. I don't yeah. understand, for me, really, uh, this is my big thing, is that subculture used to try to fight being like people used to try and fight and reject labels and I don't understand now why these subcultures are now trying to <clears throat> give themselves labels and put themselves in well, little boxes it's it's um, the post point. it's the postmodernist stuff that has been happening in the universities for a long time it's been happening for decades and now it's starting to bubble out as best this is exactly what happens in universities, it starts to bubble out into mainstream. I mean, when you have um, people in a university, you are going to university and you are you are fight you you're protesting because you're oppressed. You are attending a university, getting a, a you know a good education, and you're protesting that you're re repressed. It just it's like what? Like there's yeah. how many people in this world would, would kill to go to an, an, a good university? A lot of them. But and you know, I've even heard it being said over here, like, um, oh, what well, do you know um, that um, white men are now at the bottom of the pile? And it's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> so far mm -hmm. from the truth, you know. Yeah. It's like, um, um, well, if, if we are now at the bottom of the pile, we had a damn good run of it, didn't we? From, um, <laughs> from Roman times mm. to now, or earlier, you know. But... Um, yeah, I, I, I just don't. I, I just don't believe that white men are on the are are, are over and done with and surplus to requirement. I, um, it, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, Melissa, when's North the next? When's the next election in Canada? The next election in Canada is, I believe, it should be twenty nineteen. So right, soon. So we'll see what happens. Right. I I think there's going to be a huge swing to um progressive conservative. Yeah. If yeah, I think there's going to be a, a huge swing. What, what does that What does that mean, progressive conservative? It it doesn't make any sense. It's a conservative party, and they've always been called the progressive conservative, which okay, everybody okay. thinks everybody thinks funny. If they're the conservative party, and they call themselves the progressive conservatives, they've always been that, like for decades and decades. Okay. So it's not a new, you know, social justice warrior thing or some weird. Yeah, thing. Yeah, I was just I was just unfamiliar <laughs> with. It's kind of like yeah. in Mexico where you have the institutional revolutionary, revolutionary yeah. party. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, we have uh, no. who had power for how long and did not revolutionize institutions. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, we have more than two. So we have like progressive conservatives, liberal, new more democratic. More than two, you can do that. Well, yeah, we have a new democratic party. Something. So we got like four or five of them here that you can vote for. But usually, it's usually between the liberals and the conservatives. But um, you, do they have to create coalitions? What's that? Do they have to create coalitions? Um, sometimes. Sometimes, but not liberal didn't because liberal got um, a majority. Okay. So yeah, only only if they don't get a majority. Oh, we got pretty political here. Yeah, we did. <laughs> we did. And, and, and John, I'm glad you brought up Orwell because he, in many ways, is kind of the perfect illustration. I because, can't imagine you know, what a he lot made of people. A lot of people, you know, will bring up, and I hear it from the conservative side here in the United States. They'll, they will say, uh, you know, that they will reference Animal Farm or they'll reference 1984, but not remembering that Orwell was a socialist. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, he, he, he fought it. He fought against the fascists in the Spanish Civil War. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, he was one of the people that went over, and uh, I mean, he did what kind of like people that are are doing from from this country and i know they're doing from um, from the states as well where they're going over to syria to kind of like fight against is um and mm -hmm. the nation's saying uh, you can't go it's uh, you know and uh, 
it's illegal to go and fight these wars. But Orwell was one of those people. If he was alive today, he would be in Syria. Um, yeah. Yeah, Basically. he got pretty discouraged, I think, when he when he saw how the how the the revolution in Russia ended up. But he was also yeah. what they don't tell you. He was also very critical of the establishment in the Western democracies. Yeah, yeah. that scene in Animal but, Farm where he he sees the pigs and the humans look the same through the glass. Right, and that was his. That was the big critique of churchill and roosevelt and all these guys that you know would they they were they were the same they were just the same they were just the 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 same side of a different coin basically Mm. well uh, you know jordan peterson actually funny he has george orwell's 1984 book on there um i and i remember i'm not going to get this perfect but he did talk about orwell because orwell was also skeptical of a lot of communists because Orwell's skepticism, even though he was a socialist, his his skepticism of a lot of communism, according to Jordan Peterson, was that a lot of the um, communists or socialists, they weren't necessarily um, sympathetic to um, the poor. They were just... um, Oh, God, no. they wanted to get at the rich. They just wanted more for them. So they weren't really for the working class. And I'm not saying that that's not what Karl Marx's original idea was, certainly. But the people who were running the show, it had nothing, you know, in in in, in, in uh, communist movements, it had nothing to do with them sympathizing with the working class. They could, they really didn't care less for them because otherwise personal they, they, ambition yeah they they really actually were just really quite envious and jealous of people who had and so they wanted some but you can't if you take from people who have you just kill the ability of free markets to make money right like you you you, you can't you can't well you can but it's not a good idea to um stab at the people who are creating wealth and and try to knock them down so just so you can do better it's well, it's just if not I, a good I, idea, in my opinion. If I can just like say, I, I, uh, my parents, when I was a kid, um, they used to take us to um, communist countries on holiday because mm-hmm. they were cheap holidays. And you could yeah. get a really good holiday and it would be cheap. So um, I spent time in um, Yugoslavia. Um, the area mm-hmm. that I was in was a cru- is now Croatia, but at the time it was Yugoslavia, and that Where was a communist dictatorship. Yeah, um, and I spent time in Bulgaria as well, which at the time was a communist um, dictatorship. I can honestly say that, like, it was a whole new world for me. That's I mean, actually there was, there were funny. shops that only tourists could use that the, that the Bulgarian people themselves couldn't use, yeah. um, and um, and the difference between us and them was just massive i mean there's a story my parents um, repeat i hardly remember this at all was that there was a whole load of um, russians on holiday on the beach and um they were basically uh, uh controlled by a bloke with a whistle <laughs> you know it was like basically all coming down together um, in single file towels down blow a whistle you can go in the sea blow a whistle you now need to come out um i don't yeah. think people really Understand, and I'm, and I'm sure as hell there are people from those countries um, listening to the, me saying this and going, that isn't a, um, a reasonable description of it. But mm. this is what we took away from it, um, being well, being from a, a place which is was free, even though we were under Margaret Thatcher, yeah. um, we were we were still, you know, as free as you're ever going to get, I well, suspect. Yeah. Um, well, I can say, like, my father was an immigrant from Croatia from those times, like, would have been in the early 70s, and he was escaping. He came to Canada because they he was a legal, legal immigrant, but they were escaping that tyranny. I mean, that was going through Croatia and under the guise of communism. Unfortunately, wow. sadly, yeah. Well, people don't don't always, you know, they don't realise. I mean, um, Hitler is always held up as being like and this a great icon of probably the most evil person that has ever lived, and I ain't going to defend him in any way, shape, or form. But if you actually yeah, look at sure Stalin, did. Stalin was actually far worse. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. You know. Um, yep. And, this was... and Mao too. You know. Yep. I mean, that's that's both of them. Wh- yeah. Whenever you go to extremes and have to control people, there you go. <laughs> yep. So political we got. 
<laughs> well, guys, it's, con- uh, it's almost conspiracy, isn't it? It's, yeah, it is. <laughs> well, we were talking about the ghost of communism. So. Yeah, yeah. Boo. This, this oh, has- what does he look like? <laughs> he's got nice, a big. Surfing he's got up. a big mustache. <laughs> big nice. Mustache. You've got to be careful. It'll become a meme. There'll be people seeing him soon. And um, uh, are you guys Leibach fans? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. What's that? Are you guys fans of Leibach? Oh, the, the, the Slovenian the German, band. The, yeah. Oh, do you know? Honestly, I uh, I love them. I think they're fantastic. Um, they let it, they have a cover version of Let It Be. Um, and Opus Die was just amazing. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Great album. Uh, the version guys. of Maggie Mae was almost death metal. It was great. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for coming on. And please, uh, Melissa, tell everybody where they can hear you guys. Um, oh, you know, the best place to go because everything's there is our website um, at www.espirit.tv. And of course, please follow us on Facebook. It's Drawing Out the Spirits Podcast. And we also have a Facebook group, Drawing Out the Spirits Podcast group. <laughs> so it, easiest to just go to our website because all the links are there. I'm going to I'm going to join that group. Cool. Cool. Definitely, come and join the folk horror revival. You'll you'll see some yeah, amazing I, things. Yeah, I, I, I send a I send a request in. How many shows have you got so far now? I believe we were on episode sixteen, and we've got one coming out okay. tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, that's the your support episodes, to these yeah. guys because they're just starting out, and you know it, it's it's always important to you know podcast to help each other, and you know. Oh, out, absolutely, so. absolutely. And you've well, got to come on to ours as well. Yeah, yeah, we'd, we'd love anytime, to. Anytime, anytime. We'll, we'll, we'll do it. Perfect. We, uh, thank you guys so much for coming on. Uh, yeah, stay you. on the line for us. We're going to close out this section, and we'll be right back on Conspiracy Normal. So what do you think about that? That was pretty cool. I'd been listening to some of the uh, their podcasts, and uh, I like the whole idea of that folk magic revival and how they tie in a lot of this these different uh, personal experiences and some of the folklore, and it's pretty interesting. Yeah, I've I've en- I've have enjoyed their show. Um, I like some of the yeah a lot of the people that they get on are uh, from Britain as well. I've noticed that. Like, yeah, it does they had a, they had it has a very the anglophile UK. Yeah. Uh, there was uh, they had Soraya on from Where Did the Road Go, and they had another guy that was talking about Thelema. I think he was American, but other than that, as for the ones that I've heard, they've got a very uh, it's very uh, UK centric. Yeah, so which is kind of cool. Yeah, know? so you hear yeah, some of different. these people. They had this one guy on that was talking about wolves and the kind of like worship of wolves and guys becoming werewolves. I'm going to need to get into try to get in touch with that guy and see if we can get him on the show. That might be interesting. Problem with it with anything in the UK is just that, that, that what six hour time difference. And that was cool that John kind of stayed up or, or took a nap and woke up at two o'clock in the morning to be online with us. So, yeah, that does make it difficult. Although, uh, you yeah. know, a lot of people in this stuff are <laughs> night owls. So yeah, it's that's not true. too hard to find. That's true. That's true. We may be able to, to get some of, some of these people. So I don't know if you have paid any attention to the Anthony Bourdain stuff lately. A little bit. Um, I've just you got any thoughts on it? Like what, uh, you know, he hung himself, committed suicide. And they say that his, well, his girlfriend was a victim of Weinstein and he had made some allusions to possibly blowing the lid on some things. Yeah. On a more organized level or yeah apparently there was a tweet that he had said something against the clintons and people have hopped on that online and said that somebody knocked him off 
And of course, Alex Jones has gotten oh, he's going wagon. crazy on it. I've heard, yeah, yeah. So here's a little ex some stuff from Alex Jones. Um, Make sure you get your super male vitality. Get your super male <laughs> vitality. Alex Jones, Anthony Bourdain may have been murdered because he was going to do a Kanye West. So Alex Jones said, "This is the uh, this is the transcript script here." He says, "I'm here, ladies and gentlemen." I, I can't do that. I'll freaking yeah, die. Turn the mic down if you do that, man. <laughs> <laughs> Covering undoubtedly some of the most dangerous information I've ever covered on air. Anthony Bourdain, Tony Bourdain, is one of the most popular TV hosts in the world. He's the only successful thing on CNN. He dominated Netflix. He has a little nine-year-old daughter. He just got remarried, and then he dies in a crappy hotel room in Paris. And CNN's Brian Stetler is the first to tell us that he died of suicide hanging himself. Which, by the way, it wasn't in Paris. It was somewhere in Alsace-Lorraine. But now I, now I knew he'd been critical of Hillary, said that she shouldn't have basically defended Harvey Weinstein, said it was shameful. I knew he talked about, joked about feeding Trump hemlock. And I thought a lot of these rich, powerful Hollywood folks commit suicide, and maybe he did commit suicide. But I said the fact that he had a lot of powerful enemies, it should at least be investigated. I said that in a tweet. I got a call from my source who is even willing for me to now say who he is. But he was very emotional, and he had already let me in on this a few months ago, and he's actually even already talked about this on air. But I'm just not going to do that at this point. Here's the bottom line. I was told several months ago that a bunch of other people were going to start going public. And then, of course, you see Kanye... And then a few weeks ago, we said that even more big cultural icons, some of the biggest ones in media, some of the biggest people in culture were going to be going public. And so this morning when I woke up and I had seen that Tony Bourdain had committed suicide, supposedly, I went, what is it about that? What was it in the news? So I was sitting there search engineering for like an hour. Well, what was it? Why was it Bourdain? And then all of a sudden, the producer calls me about an hour ago, right after I got off air with you guys, and said, you've got to call this source. He's really upset right now. And I went, oh, my gosh, he's talked about it on air. Ladies and gentlemen, Bourdain was a powerful cultural figure, and Bourdain had learned about the big awakening that was happening, and he had met with Elon Musk, who he's already very good friends with in Morocco, in Marrakesh, at a big solar farm, (laughs) experimental farm, and I'll just leave it at that. And they had taped an 11 and a half minute episode of the upcoming TV series that he was wrapping up in Paris. This is two months ago. Nobody knows this. And I'm laying these facts out so people understand. He was in Morocco on a big vista at a wind farm, and I'm going to leave it at that. And I've talked to folks that were there. In fact, I've been authorized to even tell you more. Maybe I should just, should, but I'm just going to stop right there for now. This is classic Alex Jones. Oh, yeah. This is, this is the hanging, kind of man. stuff that he says all the time. Leave you hanging. And Musk and them had a Kanye West event, and Bourdain was planning to basically do a Kanye West, but just about the whole global awakening, everything that was about to happen, and it's believed that this is a message directly to Elon Musk, who's been coming out talking about the mainstream media, the globalists, how they're planning on AI technocracy takeover, so I can tell you without getting into too many specifics, but I've specifically been on the phone with SpaceX and individuals at the center of the Musk operation in the last hour, so I'm authorized to say at this point and i told folks i said we have to go public we're part of this we're all in danger and there's a lot of stuff behind the scenes some sabotage and stuff going on as well that we've become aware of even inside of info wars right now they're making big moves right now ladies and gentlemen and i want everyone to understand that this is real this is for all the marbles and it's just unbelievable i mean i've got like five six pages of notes here so is 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 the next is Kanye West gonna come out with the 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 with all like against the the uh, what do they call it the uh, the the pedo uh, was it Pizzagate the, no the pedocracy where where the pedophocracy pedophocracy that uh, McGowan talks about is that the next thing that's gonna happen I th- I think that he's referring to Kanye West coming up and saying he liked just Trump. being MAGA yeah. I, I, I think that's all it must be. Because somehow Alex Jones has spun Anthony Bourdain's death into 
something indirectly about Trump. Or just and in about general the, that he's going to become this, ant, that, that Bourdain would become this like anti-globalist right. popular he was, figure. He was going to come out, and apparently Elon Musk was with him on this. Because Elon Musk was going to spill the beans on AI, I, I don't, I don't even know, man. I, Why would I know Elon be... Musk has talked about artificial intelligence? Yeah, I didn't even think you were gonna, you were gonna talk about. I don't even think that was going to be it. I thought it was just going to be like him exposing like weird sex cult stuff or something because of the Weinstein stuff. But I, I think that's probably in there too. And Alex Jones does go on and does say that Elon Musk is in complete danger right now. Again, if he hangs himself, it's murder, ladies and gentlemen. Or if his jet crashes, it's murder. Well, I mean, he's making electric cars. <laughs> that could be, <laughs> you know, I mean. I, I, you know, like, Rob would be all, you know. He, he would really want to protect Elon Musk because I know that that's his well, favorite I mean, person. He's got his own space program and everything. I'm sure he could j- join his mercenary army, you know, and they'll I, I'm just up uh, the coast of Morocco. And there, there is so much weird shit going on in the world. Yeah. But this is just the typical th- kind of thing that Alex Jones does. Where he really spins it. Mm. And he's really, you know, the one thing that I have noticed. Everything's in, always on the brink. Yeah. Abs- absolutely. But the one thing that I have noticed is there is a certain rhetoric out there lately where their political opponents have basically become demons in their eyes. Yeah. Like, they'll kill people. They killed Anthony Bourdain. Some people said they killed this Kate Spade lady because she also spoke out against the Clintons. Uh, And, like, it's really discomforting when you have a lot of people out there that and not just Alex Jones, but a lot of other people in the conspiracy or the, yeah. the culture the, we're a part of, you know, that they, they've really just kind of, it's one thing to disagree with somebody's policies, but when you're saying like, they're basically just, they eat babies and they kill people, which as we know, does happen. Right. But it so doesn't need to be something that you spin just for your side. It needs to be something yeah. that's figured out. Right. Because obviously, like we've talked before, both sides of that kind of political spectrum, any kind of political mafia, and it doesn't matter if it's right or if it's left, are going to engage in the same kind of tactics. Yeah, it's as old as time. But there's a lot of people out there that just believe that just because someone is a Democrat, then they're just godless and child molesters. And it's like the witch hunt mentality. But who is just kind of taking over? What I don't get is why, how, I mean, I guess I'm so cynical that I don't think you can get to certain positions of power without really being compromised and being involved in really terrible stuff. Yeah. And how how was I mean I just, I don't get how someone like Alex Jones just neglects so much of Trump's nefarious connections. You know what I mean I mean what is going on is there's obviously big deep state factions at war with each other, and then on a global exactly. scale there is exactly. global factions at war with each other. And just I don't I don't understand how he he just ignores so much, man. I mean, everything that's just wide out in the open. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, such as what we've, t- I mean, I've talked about it on on the show before, you know, the Jeffrey Epstein stuff. Yeah. You know, not only yeah. was. Stuff is like wide out in the open. There's been cases about yeah. this. There's been. Not only was, you know, Bill Clinton involved with that, but Trump was involved yeah. with that too. And he built casinos. Who, Who's his friends? I mean, it's obvious. Like, Yeah. So, I mean, if, if you do accept the lesser of two evils and you're like, well, this is the only, I'm going to have to side with this faction against the, the globalists and make this deal with the devil, then be honest about it and say that, you know, and not like, oh, you know, I, I don't know, man. Uh, Jones, back in, you know, back in the day, back in like, when I first started listening to him, which is probably around 2006. And a lot of that was because I got curious about the 9-11 stuff. Yeah, that's where a lot of us got. Yeah. Me yeah. Too. And, you know, he was very much, he was almost to the point where he kind of had that, you know, a pox in both your houses kind of attitude about the, about the left and the right. And that's what I really appreciated about him. But around about Obama got elected in around about 2009, 2010, he clearly picked a side, you know, and things just got more and more just, he was always right wing, but things just more and more got down to the kind of mainstream right wing where it's like the mainstream and Alex Jones conspiracy stuff have just melted together now. And so we just have this real rhetoric out there of demonize completely like literally yeah demonizing the political opponent. And like that's in so many ways a dangerous situation. Yeah, it's And so this whole thing about Anthony Bourdain has just become somehow became this political thing. Because of a tweet that he made, and the stuff on the internet, and it just, it just, it just like, it just blows. Well, and up. even if you're on this conspiracy angle with it, I mean, is it when you're talking, you're talking about things that he was actually, things that Bourdain actually said, and things that he was threatening to do, as far as blow the lid on probably more Hollywood-centered stuff. And right. why wouldn't it? I mean, you're talking about those people have power and a whole lot of money and can get someone to kill you. You know, like, why does it have to be, oh, no, he's going to blow the lid on whatever, you know, this giant political stuff? Like, you know, thinking conspiratorially, like, who felt threatened the most and what, you know, you don't need to be deep state, mercenary, you know, whatever. You can just be some rich Hollywood guy and get some hood to kill somebody. But I don't know. I mean, it's sad too. Cause, uh, you know, people are, it's, it's good. People want to use this kind of stuff to, to, uh, put the spotlight on mental health. And, you know, there's a lot of criticism that this is really, you know, mucking that up, but it's weird at the same time. And, and, you know, he obviously was, uh, you know, talking some serious shit, and um, who knows? But yeah, Jones, of course, is gonna spin it. And yeah, that's why. I'm, that's why I'm. You know, I will say that the conspiratorial side of me says, you know, it's easy to make somebody look like they killed themselves by a hanging. I mean, that's fairly easy to do. But then again, not every suicide that we've encountered is that. You know, there has to be a certain point. It's not every single person, famous person that has killed themselves is something nefarious. Which I mean, is all like, it, takes, it feels like that's what it is now. That's what every time is something. Everybody jumps, everybody instantly jumps to. Within minutes on the... Here's the tweet that he put out on October 11th, 2017. Bourdain. Right. He says, know what Hillary Clinton is not? She's not stupid or unsophisticated about the world. The Weinstein stories had been out there for years. Uh, another one. What's so The same everyone... day, mindless Hillary hate aside, this was a terrible response to questions about a friend who's been tormenting women for decades. 
that's all that's nothing secret or right. like really scary to anyone anything that you know a million other people don't say right it doesn't threaten yeah it really doesn't threaten in the long run there's the a Clintons. million people detailing the clinton body count and all this other stuff and they're still there i mean right and somehow through that like was anthony bourdain i mean i never watched the show really i'd seen it but like, was he that much of a cultural icon that he was? If he if he went Kanye and decided that he really loved Trump, and Elon Musk had decided that they really change. loved Trump, would that have yeah. changed no. people's minds? No. There would have been just this mass exodus of all of these liberals to Trump, like no. Alex Jones is thinking. You know, like no. that that would have like the look because the Illuminati are clearly against Trump, and it's all it's all about. It's just all about th- that's all about Trump. It's not nothing to do with the globalists in Alex Jones' mind. It's just all about supporting Trump. And this is the same guy, by the way, when Trump, you know, bombed Syria a few couple of months ago, that was cussing about it. Yeah, yeah. So it's just, I think it's just him trying to be culturally and politically relevant. I guess. Like yeah, he's got something that he's got to sell. Whether he actually has a source or not, who knows? Well, everything's always on the brink, like I said. It's always, oh, man, it's about to all get blown. Oh, man, it's, you know. Right, right. Anticipation, that's just. I remember listening to Alex Jones with Joe, our good friend Joe Damari, and he told me, he said, listening to Alex Jones was kind of like, when Wiley Coyote would jump off the cliff and you would just hear, <laughs> you would see him just like stop in the middle of the air and hold a sign up. And it's like, you know, constantly it, it just, that's how he likened it. it like Alex Jones, is con- everything is constantly falling apart. Like you said, and he constantly you know, it, like, this is red alert, you know, that it's, and, and it just, it just works people up. And I can remember another friend of mine telling me when we used to listen to Alex Jones in the shop, he'd just be like, you know, this is in 2008. He told me like 15 years ago, they were saying like, hey, we need to get ready. Red Dawn is coming and all this kind of crap. And, you know, it's just. Well, yeah, that's what he played the same game the back same in the stuff. day. Back in the day, he was on before even we really got into him when he was first doing his videos and his radio show. He was on that whole 90s uh the UN troops are gonna land thing. I mean, that was yep. you know, they they got the national parks and the the UNESCO World Heritage sites are owned by United Nations, and they're gonna you know drop down blue helmets, and you know we're gonna have to fight them with the militias. And I remember one thing that he talked about was he said that UN soldiers were like cooking children and eating them and he said if you don't believe me you can go look it up the sources are there online so i typed it in in google i found the article you know where the article was from what the weekly world news yeah i've got the sources everybody remember the weekly world news yeah, I'm still waiting. Like fake news have, before it even <laughs> before there even was such a thing. I need to update on Bat Boy because that's my time <laughs> right there. His source was the Weekly World News. Bat Boy, if you're out there, you need to come to Conspiracy Normal Studio B. We want to interview with Bat Boy. That's that's what we need to do. Anyway, all right, that's kind of my rant for the evening. Okay. Um, it's good we had a kind of our alternate studio set up. Um, Rob, next, we need you back. Yeah, we need you back, Rob. So, but we will be back there next week. Um, I have a very special guest that I am excited about that uh, will be the guest ne- the next time. I'm not going to tell you who it is, but uh, just think about uh, a movie about weird creatures that came out in 2001 i'll just Mm. leave it at that so one of my favorites and we are going to get to talk to this person so i think that's it man i think we'll call it cool Um, good show all right and uh 
I will let you do the honors of telling everybody about Patreon. Okay. Wow. Put you on the spot. Wow. <laughs> okay, guys. Uh, we we are doing Pledge Week here on Conspiracy Normal. Uh, no, just uh, check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash normal And uh, we really need uh, some help getting the lights getting the lights on, fighting the Illuminati squirrels at yes. Rob's place. Uh, yes. Maybe some more additions to Studio B in case we got to do this again. Uh, just, you know, any anything helps. Whatever you can do, you can do one-time donations also at conspiranormal.com. Correct? Conspiranormal.com. One-time mm-hmm. donations. Yep. But uh, we got bonus content and uh, bonus episodes, etc. in the Patreon feed. So check that out. And... Until next time on Conspiranormal. We miss you, Rob.